So did people have profound thoughts last night about the many calendars that structure your lives? All right, we're just gonna work on that. Um, so I'm gonna start by telling you a little story. A couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine and I bought a box of chalk and took it around our neighborhood, chalking the sidewalks. And what we wrote on the sidewalks was 20 plus C plus M plus B plus 10, which seems perhaps like an algebraic equation, but in this case was not. Um, what this equation meant was that the three wise men, whose names start with those letters, C, M, and B, um, followed a star to Jesus 2010 years ago, hence the 20 and the 10, right? Um, also, C and B conveniently stand for a Latin phrase that means, may Christ bless this house. We were doing this on sidewalks outside of people's houses. Now, my friend and I did not like invent this strange chalking ritual. Um, it actually is a ritual with many centuries of precedence since the Middle Ages. Um, in some Christian communities, people have marked up their doorposts or their lentils during the ecclesial season of Epiphany. Epiphany is the church season that if, if you follow a liturgical calendar, and I'm gonna come back to what that means in a second, it's the season in which we are now. It's the church season that began January 6th and it ends right before Lent. And in my view, Epiphany is the most wonderful and least appreciated season or, or period in the church calendar um, it's not one that we tend to pay a lot of attention to in North America, but over the next two mornings, I'm gonna convert you to zealous epiphany observance. That is my aim. Um, so I said yesterday we were gonna talk about calendars and how calendars structure our lives. Um, that's not just a religious question, as it were. Lots of um, people concerned with social order and the kind of communities they create have been concerned over time with calendars and how people um, create calendars, and people have recognized that the way that we name time and structure time and inhabit time is not neutral. So um, a professor of mine from college used to famously ask, um, he would give some date, um, like, you know, is, he would say, is it an objective statement of fact to say that today is January it's not up there, 27th, 28th, 28th, 2010. And everyone in the class would say, yes, it's an objective statement of fact, except for the really smart person who would figure out that it wasn't an objective statement of fact at all, because to denote time in 2010 was to denote time with reference to the life of Christ, and that other communities um, had different events around which they uh, narrated their time. So political revolutionaries are really interested in calendars. During the French Revolution um, in 1792 uh, and 1793, the French revolutionaries abolished the Christian calendar from France and they started a new calendar. So it was no longer the year 1793, it was the year one. And all of the years would refer back to the founding of the Republic, the beginning of the French Revolution, um, as the seminal event that would give French people uh, sort of meaning and help them narrate their life in time. That calendar only lasted for like a decade and a half. It wasn't really that popular. Um, the Soviet Union did the same thing. Um, they revised their calendar omitting the weekend, which they thought was like a bourgeois luxury, um, and so they no longer had a seven-day week, they only had a five-day week, and factories were open and ostensibly productive all the time, and different groups of working people took different single days off, but there was no period devoted to rest written into the Soviet calendar, also like not the most popular calendrical revision ever undertaken in world history, it didn't last that long. But the point is, the Soviet revolutionaries understood that how they invited people to live in time would both express and shape the values of the, of the people um, in the Soviet Union. I just wanna linger over an idiom that I'm using. I'm, I've spoken now twice this morning of inhabiting time, which I know is um, a slightly awkward locution, but I'm using it intentionally. Um, usually when we stick a verb before the word time, the verb we use is spend. 
how do we spend time? Like, how did you spend your evening? Um, and I am on a lifelong quest to rid my own speech of the idiom to spend time. It's extremely difficult to do. You should try to not use that idiom for just a day or a week. It's, it's quite difficult. In fact, I bet I won't get through the morning without using the, the idiom spend time. But again, um, to sort of crystallize the ways in which how we live in time and think about time, um, the ways that that is not neutral, uh, let's just reflect for a second on the fact that most of the verbs we attach to time, most of the verbs we attach to time in our society are borrowed from the world of finance and management. So we spend time, we waste it, we save it, we manage it. These are all like banking terms that we have you know, used metaphorically when applied to time. Of course, to do that is to commodify time, is to turn time into money, and that creates a certain, it places us on a certain topography. It, it tells us how to be in time. In the 18th century, which is the period I study when I'm pretending to be a professional historian, um, in the 18th century, people didn't much speak about spending time. They spoke instead about passing the time. Now, if I asked you, like, how did you pass the weekend? I think you would think that was this strange, antiquated idiom. You might wonder if I was like somehow suggesting that you'd had a kidney stone or something. Um, <laughs> but I think that idiom actually places us in a different imaginative space than the idiom of spending time, right? I, I, when I hear someone talk about passing the time, like I picture something leisurely, front porch in not freezing cold weather, someone you know, leisurely sitting in a rocking chair drinking iced tea or something. Spending time is already more kind of grasping, frantic, utilitarian, et cetera. So I'm trying to rid my own speech of the idiom to spend time and I speak about inhabiting time. I think that it matters to God how we inhabit time, how we live in time. There's an enormous amount of attention to time all through scripture, particularly in Hebrew scripture, but also in the New Testament. Um, arguably, time is the first thing that gets created, right? And, and from that point on, there's all kinds of language in the Bible that suggests that God has dominion over time and that how we inhabit time matters to God. Psalm 74, yours is the day, yours also the night. You have fixed all the bounds of the earth, you have made summer and winter, etc. right? So time is something that God created and cares about, and I think that how we live in time matters. So most Christian communities, I must say, have agreed with me that how we live in time matters, but Christian communities have disagreed amongst themselves about what kind of calendar is the most faithful um, calendar for Christians to live in. So Puritans from England and New England, um, wow, you all cheer at the weirdest things. Um, <laughs> Puritans, um, Puritans identified Sunday as the only holy day in the calendar. And this was a theological statement. This, to identify Sunday as the only meaningful holy day was to say Christians live in resurrection time. All of our time is about standing at the empty tomb. We, we live solely in light of the resurrection and therefore we don't need to sort of return as a community to previous events in Christ's life. So, right in colonial New England, Christmas was illegal. It was illegal to celebrate Christmas because we needed to just be standing at the empty tomb, forget about like standing at the manger, right? So that's one kind of Christian calendar to, to exist sort of solely and intensely and intentionally in Sunday in resurrection time. Another kind of Christian calendar um, and the one that my community, the Anglican community, among other communities, tries to inhabit um, is a calendar that we might call a calendar of Christological time. This is a calendar that evolved during the early church, during the first centuries of the church, and it was the calendar that gave us the seasons, the liturgical seasons that are sort of familiar to us, Advent, Christmas, Lent, etc. And as you know, all of those holidays and all of those seasons, Advent, Christmas, Lent, invite people to reprise the life of Jesus, to live each year um, in a pattern that returns practitioners, returns Christians to the seminal events and experiences of Jesus' own life. So to live that calendar is, in a sense, 
to, to have a kind of way through time of getting to know Jesus, of getting acquainted with Jesus and the rhythms of his own life. So it's in that Christological calendar, which again asks us at various points in the year to focus on different moments in Christ's life and different aspects of Christ's personality and Christ's ministry and Christ's mission. Um, I think the most neglected season in that calendar is the one we're in now, which is the season of Epiphany which became a sort of robustly observed season by the late fourth century. Um, and during the late fourth century, early fifth century, ministers began to focus on the three wise men and the gifts they brought to Jesus during the season of Epiphany. Those, those became common themes for Epiphany preaching because, as people understand, understood, the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus told us, told people something about who Jesus was, right? So gold told us that Jesus was a king, um, frankincense, which had been burned, an incense that was burned by ancient Israelites before the tent of meeting, told us that Jesus like was the truest tent of meeting, the truest place we could go to meet God. And myrrh, of course, which was used for embalming, told us from the beginning of Christ's life that he was born to die, right? So these gifts all told us something about who Christ was. And the reason we call the season Epiphany um, is that this is, Epiphany comes from the Greek um, for manifestation or to appear or to show forth. So the season of Epiphany invites us, gives us an opportunity to do two things for these weeks after Christmas and before Lent. The first is to pay attention and rediscover who Christ is. Who is Christ? What are the stories in scripture that manifest something of Christ's identity and work to us? And the second thing that Epiphany gives us an opportunity to do is then to consider how we can go make Christ manifest in the world. So I have to say, again, this is not a season that evangelicalism has like robustly embraced, but I find that very curious. Now, just bear in mind that I became a Christian in England and I came back to the United States from England thinking that it made sense when I told people that I was an Anglo-Catholic evangelical Anglican, like that somehow I thought that all kind of held together as some sort of unified Christian identity. Um, but Epiphany, it seems to me, is an intensely both evangelical and evangelistic moment in our annual um, church cycle, and it's appropriate that the special services here are happening during Epiphany, precisely because this is the season where the church says to us, focus on who Christ is, remind yourselves who Jesus is, and then ask yourselves who, um, who you can be in the world to show forth Christ's life in the world. Now, it's ironic to me, because I'm sort of obsessed with Epiphany, I pay attention to how the word Epiphany gets used in like common secular parlance. And it's ironic to me that although it has these kind of ancient Jesus-y, churchy connotations, like most people in North America today are not thinking about showing forth Christ's life um, or thinking about the church when they use the word epiphany. Here's one usage of the word epiphany I recently ran across. It came from a college student newspaper in Toronto and here is what the student writing in the newspaper wrote. Quote, that is when I had an epiphany. My makeup is my most important fashion accessory. Um, there was an art exhibit that I learned about a couple of years ago at Georgetown, the university in DC. Um, that exhibit was made by an artist named Lisa Austin, and she used all kinds of different media, fabrics, photography, furniture. It was a very multimedia art exhibit, and the title of the exhibit was Epiphany. And the artist said that she hoped that the exhibit would invite people who viewed it, who were principally college students, because there it was on the campus of Georgetown, that it would invite college students who usually are captive to their own myopic personal concerns to, quote, have epiphanies to make global connections that usually you cannot make as a teenager or adolescent or college student. Um, epiphany also has been a word that's shown up in the last eight years as our nation has been involved in wars. So Donald Rumsfeld, when he was still in charge of those things, um, said that he had had an epiphany about insurgency and violence in Iraq, right? So 
So the word just shows up in all kinds of ways in our common speech that actually have nothing to do with communal instincts, um, Christian instincts. Instead, we now use this word to typically denote a highly individualized realization, right? Like, oh, I had an epiphany the other day that I needed to break up with my boyfriend, Bob, or whatever. Um, so that tells us something about our individualistic age, how we now use, uh, use this term. But again, epiphany historically is about a community attending to who Jesus is. Um, so it's, it's a helpful season for reflecting, as I suggested, on the scripture passages that tell us something about Jesus' identity. Um, it is also a helpful season for intentionally undertaking work in the world that shows forth Jesus's light and Jesus's life, whether that's, you know, going on a Habitat for Humanity build or going on an Epiphany mission trip or doing something intentionally evangelistic that invites someone um, into church, etc. cetera. Um, for the rest of our few minutes this morning and then tomorrow, I'm gonna ask us to look a little closely at some of the scripture passages that people traditionally read during Epiphany, and I'm just gonna mention one this morning. Um, one of the passages that churches often read during the season of, of Epiphany is the story of Philip and Nathaniel um, at the end of the first chapter of John. So that, as you know, is where Jesus first calls Philip, and he just says to Philip, simply follow me, and Philip does follow him. And Philip then extends that invitation to his friend Nathaniel, um, and Nathaniel says, uh, Philip says, the promised one of Israel has come, this carpenter from Nazareth, and Nathaniel, as you know, is aghast. Like, Nazareth? That's totally impossible. I don't I'm not totally up on like the Wheaton rivalries, but this would be equivalent to like at Duke, if you, where I teach, if you said someone, someone the Messiah has come and he was educated at Carolina, you know, it would seem the Tobacco Road uh, rivalry would make that impossible. Thank you for cheering. Um, so Philip doesn't take no for an answer, right? He says simply come and see, which is in a sense the epiphany injunction. Epiphany says to us, come and see who Jesus is, and then bids us to go into the world and say to other people, come and see who Jesus is. And Nathaniel does, of course. He comes and hears and, and, and sees who Jesus is for himself. Um, I think that that's a wonderful epiphany story. And it's a wonderful epiphany story because it invites us to rediscover who Jesus is and to see differently because of that. I often think during the season of Epiphany of the movie Amistad, I don't know if anyone remembers that movie, but there's a slave in Amistad who becomes a Christian. And the central way that you know that he's become a Christian is that for the rest of the film, everywhere he looks, he sees crosses. I mean, they're not necessarily real crosses, but he sees in architecture, he would look at you know, the panes in the window and see that they were actually made up of lots of, of little crosses. And it's a very visually powerful reminder that part of what we learn to do each year during this epiphany concentration on who Jesus is, is that we learn to see who Jesus is, and then see who Jesus is in the world. So Epiphany is inviting us to rediscover who Christ is, and the gospel tale of Nathaniel and Philip, you know, is giving us, in a sense, Nathaniel's epiphany moment, the moment in which Nathaniel discovers who Jesus is. Again, this is a season that is not content with letting us sit at home with our Bibles, making this rediscovery. It is a season that like really all of the actions in the church life pushes us back into the world to make Jesus's manifestation to us manifest um, in society. I think that Philip, um, one of the reasons I really like this Philip and Nathaniel story is that I think that Philip is quite wise to not get into like a long haggling argument with Nathaniel. He is wise, I think, to respond to Nathaniel's skepticism with an invitation simply to come and see for himself who this carpenter from Nazareth actually is. It seems to me that sometimes saying to our neighbors simply come and see is the best invitation to Christianity that we can offer. Come and see who Jesus Christ is and what life 
in Jesus Christ, life dancing with the triune God, um, life under the lordship of Jesus is like. So Epiphany, this season that we are now in, is, I think, a season to be like Nathaniel. It is a season to come and see afresh who God is. And it is also a season to imitate Philip, to show forth Christ's life and light and love in the world, um, to invite others to see who Christ is. Let us pray. Lord, during this season of Epiphany, help us to come and see Emmanuel, God, with us. Help us come and see the lamb slaughtered for our sins. Help us see the babe in the manger. Help us see the one who sits at the right hand of the Father. Help us see the king of the Jews mocked on the cross. Help us see the apple of the Father's eye. Help us see the one who is friend to sinners. Help us see the bread of life. Help us see the one who dines with tax collectors and whores. Help us see the resurrected life. Help us see the tidings of great joy. Help us see the pearl of great price. Help us see the judge who's coming again we await. Help us see the prince of peace. Help us see the bridegroom of the church. Help us see God incarnate. Help us see the living water. Help us see the author and finisher of our faith. Help us see the one we meet on the road to Emmaus. Help us see the one who is present in the breaking of bread. Help us see the one who hears our prayers. Help us see the one who knows the desires of our hearts. Help us see the shepherd who finds that one stray sheep. Help us see the one who shows us the Father. Help us see the Savior of all the world. And once you have helped us so to see, help us make his light and life manifest in that world which you created, sustain, and redeem. Amen. <laughs>